you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the com. The Chris Voss com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends, gentlemen, ladies, children, people of all ages. Welcome to the big podcast circus tent in the sky. We have the most amazing minds, brilliant th- thinkers, uh, brightest people, and none of them are me. <laughs> we have an amazing gentleman on the show. We're going to be talking about his latest book uh, that's just coming out. And it's uh, we're going to be talking about the pursuit of perfection or maybe the pursuit of meh, whatever. Uh, we'll get into his book and everything that goes into it. And I think it will be illuminating in your mind at expanding it on uh, maybe how to be more happy in life. And, uh, you know, so basically, if you don't want to be more happy in life, this probably isn't the show for you. But you should listen to the full show if you do want to be happy in life. And I'm sure you want your friends, neighbors, relatives, and dogs and cats to be happy as well because they're just better to be around. And uh, it makes Thanksgiving dinner go so much easier. Uh, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives as a setup I'm doing. Go to goodreads.com, forward slash Chris Voss, youtube.com, forward slash Chris Voss, linkedin.com, forward slash Chris Voss. Uh, subscribe to that big LinkedIn newsletter. I think grows like a weed. Like every day I go in, I go, Jesus, what's going on over here? Uh, see us on TikTok, Chris Voss One, and the Chris Voss Show podcast. And guess what? The new Facebook, Instagram Threads, which is a Twitter competitor, launched uh, yesterday. And uh, hopefully, you're checking that out. It's going to give Elon Musk's Twitter a, a run for its money. So check us out over there. I'm there at uh, Chris Voss Official and uh, the Chris Voss Show. You may have heard of it, the Chris Foss Show. 14 years, 1,400 episodes. We're almost at 1,500, so i got to quit saying that. Uh, we have an amazing gentleman and mind on the show. He's the author of the newest book that's just come out, uh, August 8th, 2023, The Perfection Trap, Embracing the Power of Good Enough. You know, not everyone can be me. Thomas Curran is on the show with us today. Did I get that last name right, uh, Thomas? You did, Chris. And can I just say, what an introduction that's I know. incredible. I'm super pumped now. I, that's what we do on the show, baby. <laughs> we super pump. So uh, Thomas is an amazing gentleman. He is the uh, associate professor in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science at the London School of Economics. He is a world-leading expert on perfectionism. So is he perfect or perfection of the billionaires? Or we'll find out. He has written for the Harvard Business Review, featuring the new scientists, and his work has been covered by publications including The Guardian, Telegraph, Wall Street Journal, and Ariana Huffington's Thrive Global Campaign. There you go. In 2018, he gave a TED Med talk entitled Our Dangerous Obsession with Perfection is Getting Worse. And now he's here to talk to us about his latest book. Welcome to the show, Thomas. How are you? Thank you, Chris. Very well. There you go. Thank you for coming. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, give us the dot coms wherever you want people to stalk you on the interwebs. Okay, so my website is tomcurran.com. It's Tom spelled T-H-O-M. It's Curran spelled C-W-R-A-N.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Tom, T-H-O-M underscore Curran, C-W-R-A-N. Or uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Thomas hyphen Curran. There you go. So what motivated you want to write this book? Well, I've just been doing loads of research in this area for about a decade now. Um, I sparked my interest really from a kind of personal uh, experience with perfectionism. Uh, I struggled with it for a lot of my uh, early life, putting a lot of pressure on myself, finding that I was turning into a bit of a uh, obsessive when it came to work and play and all sorts mm-hmm. of areas of my life. And it was having an impact on my mental health. So I thought, I wouldn't it be interesting, you know, uh, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Maybe we can look at some research in the area of perfectionism. Wasn't a great deal there. So that was where it started. There you go. Uh, so you've entitled the book, uh, entitled? You've The book is entitled with the title, uh, The Perfection Trap. Why is the seeking perfection a trap? Well, perfection is, is by definition an impossible goal, right? So um, 
for those who try, it's going to be forever beyond the possible. Uh, it's often nebulous. We can't really define it. It's, I suppose it's like a bottomless pit, right? You just deplete oh. this in its pursuit. And, and I, I, feel, I like to think about it like chasing the horizon. So, you know, the closer you get, the further it gets away. And this is this kind of trap that we all find ourselves in when we're pursuing something that's just impossible to attain. So that's really the perfection trap. There you go. And uh, so why is this an issue for us? I mean, it seems like, you know, there might be a lot of people that uh, strive for perfection. We kind of see this uh, Instagram world we talked about earlier in the green room where, you know, everyone tries to present themselves as perfect. You know, we have these influencers that, you know, buy these fake sets of private planes and, and rent cars for the day and take pictures of them. And, and there's this there's this fake persona that we seem to be building out of PR and everybody kind of buys it especially here in america where everyone's like oh that guy must really be a millionaire and you know like seriously i'm not even kidding you i've had coaches that i thought were killing it and they were talking about their big people they were doing and two of them that i know of were actually finally came out and told everyone they were living out of their car for the past couple of years i'm not even kidding you um and yet they had been faking it and i felt really betrayed i never given them any of my money but I believe they were successful. I'm like, why are these guys so successful? Because some of their stuff is crap. But, you know, we live in this. I, I think I, there might be something about millennials and Gen Z where they, they adopted this. I think millennials it was. They adopted this fake it till you make it attitude. Only mm -hmm. they took this like a little too far. What do you think about that? Well, it's funny because, you know, living inside a culture, right, we, we scarcely recognize its absurdities, right, because we're just consumed and surrounded by it. And if perfection is everywhere and you see perfection everywhere, you know, you're going to think that it's your responsibility to be perfect too. It's a bit like, um, oh. you know, uh, Lance Armstrong when the, oh, the doping scandal blew up and he told Oprah Winfrey that, you know, he did it because everyone else was doing it, right? Like, so how we behave, even if it's unhealthy, right? Even if mm -hmm. it's something that's imperiling our health, like this kind of impossible pursuit of perfection, if everyone else is doing it, Chris, then of course we're going to respond by to try to sort of do it ourselves. And I think that's what ha just what happens right now in modern culture where we've kind of got ourselves in this echo chamber, this sort of arms race where everyone is perfect and so we expect ourselves to be perfect too and and i you know i don't know was uh, to clarify on that topic was that a cop-out that he was doing because i don't think everyone's <laughs> juicing on the on the french uh tour or whatever it is well, i think at the time like it was pretty widespread yeah i think was it's it? generally generally accepted that most of the peloton um had ah. uh had been uh had some help um ah. yeah pretty you know not everyone there were like some valiant examples who stayed off but then they got nowhere near the top right so in order yeah. to in order to win you kind of had to do it he kind of took more um yeah so what creates this culture of of perfection, fear of missing out, fear of not being, uh, you know, is it a peer pressure? Is it just a societal pressure? Uh, is it a keeping up with the Joneses? You know, that's real big here in America. Why, why does, why is this such a big deal for us? Why can't we, you know, why can't you just named your book, uh, the perfection trap embracing the good power of, eh, meh, whatever. <laughs> well, the, okay. I'll give you a really profound answer to this. The reason why we do this is because if we don't, the implications for our economy would be quite catastrophic. Uh -huh. Because think about it like this, right? The economy spins on an axis of consumption, mm -hmm. right? We need to consume more goods and services because that creates jobs, which creates more goods and services, which creates jobs and so on and so on, right? This is how the uh, capitalist growth-based economies work. And they've worked remarkably well. But what we're seeing at the moment is kind of, of is kind of almost the end point of this process where essentially everybody has to really feel a sense of discontent, has to need to try to improve their lives, mm. have more, do better, be more productive, because essentially without those behaviors, our economy would collapse. And so really, oh. I think if you want to get at the root of this, it's this kind of focus and um, almost kind of morbid dependency that our economy has on growth and uh, at, at all costs. And I think what we're seeing in, in uh, young people at the moment is really a, a natural response to that, where, you know, they're told all the time through advertising, social media, schools, colleges, whatever it might be, you need something more, you need to do more, you need to be more, you need to have more, you need to work more, you need to consume more. Right. And I think that they're really just internalizing that as in pre precious to be perfect. And I think that's what we're seeing. Um, mm. Now, we, we can get more granular about, you know, how that's expressed in the specific areas. But like the root, I think I think that's where it's coming from. 
There you go. Hi, folks. Here's Voss here with a little station break. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We'll resume here in a second. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come to my coaching speaking and training courses website. You can also see our new podcast over there at chrisvossleadershipinstitute.com. Over there, you can find all the different stuff that we do for speaking engagements, if you'd like to hire me, uh, training courses that we offer, and coaching for leadership, management, entrepreneurism, uh, podcasting, corporate stuff. Uh, with over 35 years of experience in business and running companies as a CEO, and be sure to check out Chris Voss Leadership institute.com now back to the show so in the book do you address you know why we have these these uh, obsessions and uh maybe how to resolve them or square them in our mind to maybe be a little more healthy you know i mean one thing i did for years is i was so busy pursuing you know success and money and building companies that i really didn't take care of myself or my happiness my health i let my health suffer I let, you know, being present in my world with my, with the the people I loved suffered, you know, everything was like, I'm working on perfection. Uh, I'll fix all this other shit later. Yeah. I think if we're always searching for the next thing, we never can exist in the moment. And what you, you know, what you said there is absolutely (laughs) right. You know, the route to happiness is to really try and let go of all those societal pressures to obviously Mm -hmm. acknowledge them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to succumb often and, you know, and sometimes actually it's fine. You know, if you want to consume, you want to buy a nice car, that's all, you know, if it makes you happy, great, you know, do it. Why not? Sure. But but you can't let it um, completely take over your life. I think that's the thing, you know, you have to kind of have some separation between, you know, wanting to do more, striving to be better, but also appreciating that in this moment that you're enough. Like what you have right now is means that you're enough. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's a beautiful thing to understand. And it doesn't mean that you can't want to do more. It just means that you can accept and appreciate uh, and have gratitude for the things that you do have in this moment. And that's a really hard thing to do in this culture, but it is the way to happiness. Yeah. I think people see it is it, well, uh, I'll ask you, I is, is the problem that people see it as black and white. You're either striving for for perfection and being a go-getter and, and whatever at all costs. Or if you're, if you're, if you're a person who's like has gratitude and like, okay, I'm good enough as I am, and I'm a a great person, and I'm going to strive to be better and improve myself in the ways that I want to improve myself. Um, And and some people see that as like, well, you're you're not chasing the dream. We're not making black and white that we they have. We we're not finding the gray area of like you know you can still do both. Yeah, like well, I think the thing is, and like you're not making something of yourself. You're not making something of yourself, man. You got to make something of yourself. Who doesn't want to make something of themselves? And I think, you know, this pressure at all times to continue to, uh, you know, break new ground, work hard, prove ourselves every day that, you know, we're worth something in this world and being worth something means having loads of stuff, working really hard, grinding, hustling, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, I think that's, those are, those are really life pressures. That's how we feel all the time i feel that all the time i'm sure your listeners do too uh mm-hmm. it's quite natural it's quite normal um but there's you know you don't throw the baby out of the bath for it. it's not about saying okay well ditch all that kind of you know that kind of sense of striving what it's about is trying to understand that that is that is not the be all and end all that is not should not consume your whole identity your life should not be wrapped in more bigger better and proving to other people all the time that you're worth something uh it you know it should really be about like you said this kind of inner sense of contentment that you know well i'm gonna try i'm gonna work hard i'm gonna try and be the best that i can be and i know there's gonna slip up and i know i'm gonna fail but that's okay you know life's a bit of a jagged path and it's okay so you gotta you gotta approach your life with a bit more serenity and i think sometimes it's really difficult as i said in this culture definitely i especially in american culture uh you know I don't know how much you have the Instagram going on over there. I know you have a guy pretending to be king or something over there. I don't know. What's going on <laughs> lately, but I don't know. There was a queen, and then there's like some new guy, and and then every now and then you guys. Uh, I I I think I've been impressed. You know, you guys have stuck with a prime minister now for at least over a month, so that's going good for you. Um, so you guys, you guys, you guys are pretending to be a country over there. So I'm convinced, you. like nothing's real. Like it, the, it, it does. There's, it isn't happening. I'm in the Truman Show. <laughs> like what's happening in the UK and the monarchy oh. and the and the prime. Like that's just a, a fiction. And there's some kind of detachment because this moment it can't be real. It can't be real. Yeah. 
it's it's uh you know it's it's a uh, it's interesting it's it's interesting to watch and i'm sure we are too but you know like we don't care we're just we're just america america <laughs> Um, but no, we, in America, we have a real big thing with, uh, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, keeping up with the neighbors, you know, the neighbor gets a boat, we got to get a boat, you know, um, I know a lot of people who have this sincere drive and belief that they can be Elon Musk and they don't realize how narrow and rare and what a lottery hit that is. Yep. to to get a perfect run and and most times they don't even understand that you know people like him and and others that succeed usually grew up with you know money family money power um in in a good seed and and a lot of times they just got fucking incredibly lucky uh you know i mean and and but they still have this delusion and this drive that I will be Elon Musk someday. I had that same sort of thing. I thought I was going to be a multimillionaire. You know, it, it, there's a famous line from Fight Club where we're, you know, we're, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, Fight Club, but there's a line in it where Brad Pitt says the line, you know, we're a generation of men who are raised thinking that we're all going to be rock stars and millionaires by, you know, told us by advertisers, movies, television, and we're finding out that we got lied to and we're not very happy about it. Um, and I think it's worse with this new generation because social media can be such a fakery. You know, it's so fake. Uh, everything, you know, I think a comedian said once that, that when archeologists dig up our society from years from now, because God knows it's not going to survive at this space. Um, they're going to go, Holy shit. The whole society smiled 100% of the time because all their pictures show them, fucking smiling and perfect filters and you know they have this filter thing now uh on tiktok where you know i can if, if i put the filter on i probably look like a victoria's secret model like it can make any woman any person look like a victoria's secret model like and like they're 20 again and yeah. it's just like the ultimate catfishing and they're all, and, and most all of them are using some sort of filter thing even in my dating pools and you're just like you're just like you, you can't trust anything anymore but it's just, just striving for perfection and having this image. And, you know, everyone's a brand now, I think is a big problem too. I mean, basically you're a brand now. So if you're on yeah. Instagram, if you're on a dating, everything is a brand. So you're a brand and you're pushing your brand. Your brand has to be perfect if you want to succeed and you have to get the perfect followers and blah, 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 blah. But there's a madness to it that's just extraordinary. And I think highly unhealthy because I, I, I think at some point, most people become deluded that they are as great as they think they are, or they imagine that they're presenting on social media. Yeah, I mean, this that was that was a great synopsis, by the way, of, <laughs> of uh, American culture. And I would say that this is the economy working exactly <laughs> how it's supposed to work. You know, yeah. like this idea that you know we need more, we must do more, we have to project more, and that we must be competing all the time with everyone and all around us. And I, I'll take you back to the point you were making about. Uh, expectations for success and these kind of high mm -hmm. profile business people, because that's really interesting. It kind of follows this kind of idea of meritocracy that, you know, if you work hard, you put the effort in, you're going to get to the top. Now, what's really interesting in America and in the UK, um, 60s, 70s in the post-war, you know, the New Deal, post-war consensus, there was capacity and slack in the economy. You know, you had baby boom generation coming through. Um, there was uh, healthy rates of growth year on year people could move up the social ladder and they did there was a burgeoning middle class inequality was the lowest it's been and people did get richer they did ascend they did lift themselves up from the bootstraps however we still have the same folklore today but a completely different economy and what yeah. young people are seeing right now is they're hearing that you know look if you just do this you can be you, you you can have a good life you can be rich and all the rest of it but actually that's being met with a stone cold reality of an economy that just isn't giving them anywhere near as much opportunity and potential as has been previous generations psychologically can you imagine that for young people right yeah that's really tough they're working really hard but they can't get a house because housing is too expensive or especially in the big cities right they have to extend time when they're having their family because they're now only two incomes right they don't need mm -hmm. rather than one that's how it used to be right so there's a constant strain and stress that even though they're putting so much into this world they're not getting the same amount back and that's this is massively weighing on their perfectionism their identities as kind of 
you know, embrace the grind set. You got to hustle. My identity. I'm, I basically treat myself like an asset to be traded on the job market floor, right? I don't have a career anymore. I just jump from gig to gig to gig to gig, and I hustle and grind. Um, and this is just a completely like whole new world of ever increasing expectations, pressures, uh, and young people, uh, and everyone actually, but young people in particular are, are, mm-hmm. are internalizing these pressures of pressure to be perfect. And I don't think we can blame them. There you go. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, you mentioned our economy and how it works. Uh, uh, well, let's get this other way first. Does, do, so do we just need to eliminate the word perfection and say, we're driving to be better, striving to be better, we want more. We're striving to more. But, you know, this madness of being perfect. Like, I know people that they have tried to turn every bit of, you know, the, the toilet paper has to be in the right place. And uh, it has to be, you know, perfectly whatever. And then the, the the paper towels have to be there. And nothing can be in a place. Everything has to be, you know, I, I've had friends that are really ADHD. And so if you go to their house and you take their pictures and you just, just squeak them a notch or whatever the word is you just twist them a notch it will drive them mad like you'll literally see them go spend an hour putting that thing back to balance uh and not realizing you fuck with them um you know i I, (laughs) i'm evil what can i say i learned it from some friends but uh you know i i've had friends i mean the you can't have a spot on the thing i've had girlfriends that if you spill just a a, a minuscule amount of whatever on the counter and you, you haven't cleaned it up in the first five seconds that it's spilt, you know, it, Oh my God, the world's going to end. It's a nuclear this catastrophe. You know, it's a, it's an emotional crisis and yeah. there are men and women. There are people that operate that way. Do we, do we need to take, you know, just this whole madness of perfection and just be like, I don't know. You got to be like, uh, who's that? jack handy guy or whatever from snl where you look in the mirror and you go i'm good enough people like me <laughs> <laughs> yeah like i think it's it's, it's so true I, look, I struggle with it i mean i i am a, i've struggled with perfectionism pretty much all my adult life so you know it's not easy to to let it go when mm-hmm. your whole life you feel like it's the one thing holding you up but everything and all around you seems to be collapsing your perfectionism is one thing pushing you forward it's making you successful and all the rest of it so you know letting something like that go something as important that to you go is really difficult but i can only tell you from my own experience that if you're able to just take a step back let life in a little bit let life happen to you a little bit um, rather than trying to happen all the time in the world, accept that you are fallible, that I'm exhaustible, that I am going to age and decay and get wrinkles mm-hmm. and gray hairs and all the rest of it. And this is normal and this is natural. And this is just, you know, this is the life course uh, of all living beings, including humans, by the way. And I'm, I'm, in America, we try and push past that as much as we possibly can. Don't do that. Try Just embrace that common humanity because you will feel so rejuvenated and have find, find so much solace in the acceptance that, uh, we are just fallible human beings. And so that's the, you know, the biggest thing I think for us yeah. all to, to remember. And, and you address in the book, I think the, the fallout from this people who uh, have abject burnout, depression, uh, and you mentioned the book, it's we're at record levels of that, which we are welcome to America. Everyone's on <laughs> Prozac here. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that and how that's, how this drive contributes to that and why people might be struggling right now. Cause there's probably somebody out there going, I'm about losing my mind here. Yeah, I mean, America is the world champion at all things, good and good and not so good. Uh, if it's if there's an extreme, it'll be in America. And <laughs> and what we're seeing is is that exactly as you said, you know, like high and rising levels of perfectionism in response to the things we talked about. You know, young people feeling those pressures, um, and that's really what my research rose to prominence on the back of really this kind of finding that young people and interestingly social perfection we call it social prescribed perfectionism Uh this is a sense that other people expect me to be perfect right so Mm -hmm. you know and they're watching me and they're judging me uh this element of perfection is really really taking off and we're on an exponential curve right so we're Mm -hmm. really we're really flying now with this one and that's kind of worrying because um 
that's the most extreme form of perfectionism. It's the most highly correlated with significant mental distress. So if you didn't want to see any form of perfectionism growing, it would have been that one, but that is the one that's going on. I know that men and women have two different drives, or well, everything is a drive to propagation of the species. Uh, women have a drive to uh, you know, use their beauty agency to look better. They, you know, they buy all the makeup. It drives our economy, uh, what women buy. Um, you know, I think they control like most of the money and buying power in America. I think it's like 80 or 90%. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if they're married, they're usually the one doing the buying and stuff. Um, and, and women buy a lot of stuff. I mean, they, they, they consume a lot. They take, they buy stuff for the household. They buy stuff for makeup. Um, you know, they're usually, they're usually taking care of all that stuff. Um, and, but, but they're also working on their agency, their beauty agency. You know, they, I, I've asked people, I'm like, if you're married, why are you putting makeup on every day and going out? Um, so, you know, they're really focused on that and how they present for men. We have a different agency where our world looks at us from what resources we provide and what we contribute. We're not beauty objects. I mean, have you seen me lately? Um, so, you know, you look we, great, thank you. You're looking great. Okay. <laughs> flatter will get you everywhere um i go to the gym now so it's good um but you know we're not worth a lot as men in our younger years we have to build a great job build a good career get a good income going you know it takes us longer to kind of do things because we have to build things we're not born into beauty and so we don't really hit our peak value to society till about 45 55 because that's when our peak earning is our our you know, and we're looked at to be to be providers and protectors. So, you know, in, in women's hypergamy, they want us to earn more than they do. And so they're looking for a guy who's got this going on. You know, and I had this problem when I was young. I mean, when I was a, you know, a, a junior or se sophomore in school, I wanted to date fellow sophomore girls. Well, they weren't interested in that. They wanted to date the guy with the car, the senior, you know, the guy who's, who's uh, you know, going and doing stuff in life and having fun. And they didn't want to date the guy who's, you know, coming up. And so men are on this journey where we're trying to, you know, build this life, build this resource, you know, give that signaling, if you will, to women that, hey, I got it going on and I'm going places in my life. You know, I'm buying a nice car and blah, blah, blah. Um, and women look for that. I mean, there are dating pools when we're like, OK, what's your job? What's your college? What's your income? What's your, you know, I mean, how good of a provider are you going to be? That's how it works. Um, and then women are, are doing their thing to buy. And it really drives our economy because everyone's buying shit. Like, you know, I mean, I meet people that it's like, hey, I bought another purse for 10 grand, some fashion person. I'm like, how many of these do you have? I have uh, you know, 20 or 50 of them. I'm like, Jesus Christ, at one point, like, do you, you know, I've had girlfriends where I go in the closet and I'm like, every closet in this home is filled with your clothes going back to the sixties and seventies or something. I'm old. What can I say? And so <laughs> basically I'm like, you're never going to wear any of this stuff, <laughs> you know, and, and women are by nature harvesters. Uh, you know, it's, it all comes down to cave and stuff. So hunter gather, you know, it's all that yeah. shit going on. And so yeah. men are hunters. We go out and hunt stuff down and, and uh, all that good stuff. So it, it's interesting how it all drives our economy. At, at what point do we, hey, at what point do we say, you know, hey, man, just calm the fuck down. And I mean, is that just going to kill our economy? Is it going to crash if we, if we all just collectively <laughs> one day go, we got enough shit. Quit ordering shit on Amazon all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like you, you say we're we're hunter hunter garrers. Um, I think the the for for me, like you know, the that kind the modern equivalent of that is can you like back in a lorry driver, or do you have to get your dad to go and do it? Like this is, <laughs> I come from a small town, so this is this is our vocabulary. Like, uh, you know, and I, now I'm in a middle class world. If I try and back in the lorry driver, he's like, go and get your dad. <laughs> it'll do, it'll do. <laughs> Ah, it a ah, don't need this again. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so wow. now I feel like quite emancipated sometimes being in a different world from where my where my working class roots where everyone's like, you know, all the rest of it. So it's funny you should say that because there's definitely that goes on. Uh now your question was was this a, you know, is this kind of is this it, is this is it is the economy like is it driving what we're seeing? And I think that's absolutely true. I think 
women definitely are targeted a lot by uh, consumerism by advertising um for the reasons that you stated and so you know we don't see any differences in perfection across men and women which is interesting but mm -hmm. certainly they are definitely way more targeted than men when it comes to like appearance how does she look how does she behave all the rest of it and so you know mm -hmm. the interaction of their perfectionism with that world can create a lot of distress and worries about you know how they look and self-presentational concerns um and and all of those things you know we see way higher levels in in women than we do in men and so i think you know it, it, it's certainly true that that's the case and this is why you know there is a big drive among uh, young women now to try to kind of push back on that a little bit be you know just kind of be real movement show our authentic selves all the rest of it i think we've got a long way to go uh don't get me wrong but nevertheless like there seems to be some kind of counterculture going on at the moment which um i think is is quite good news um when it comes to males yeah you know we we are uh, we are still you know bombarded with other expectations and i would say actually in more recent years, we too have been ex a little bit, you know, exposed to some of these more image-based ideas, particularly younger men. You know, you've got to look a certain way. You've got to have that sculptured body. You've got to go to the gym and you've got to eat the right foods and you've got to have the right skin regime and all the rest of it. Like, So I think it's coming for, for men a little bit. Um, but we, you know, it is true to say that we're not quite, it's, it's not quite as um, as vociferous as it is for, for young, young women. It's getting there. Right? There's these TikTok ads they've had about, men's skin and facial skin and like stuff that they can use for their skin and i'm like what the fuck is going on uh you know it, it, it better well, underwear. Your, your skin looks great chris i want to know what oh, your skin regime is uh i don't know i i don't know take a shower every couple of days or something I don't there know. you go um must, but i do must... go to the gym i mean that helps but uh i don't know i've been kind of blessed but it, it, with my health and stuff uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't really have that perfect skin. I got I got crow's feet and or crow's wrinkles or eyes or whatever the hell I call them. Uh, got a little bit of turkey neck going from losing weight. Uh, but no, it, it's it, it's it's interesting to me. So, what's the best way? Uh, I and mean, people need to read your book, of course, to learn more about this. But is gratitude kind of the, gratitude was one thing I kind of learned by having gratitude. It helped me actually get more because it helped me kind of say. There's enough. I'm whole. I'm present. And how can I how can I improve myself? And I actually, and instead of trying to chase what the advertisers show me, you know, because I learned a long time ago being in the advertising business, when when advertisers show like something in say Vogue, they show a woman in a beautiful dress, and there's a guy who's always kind of behind her. He the guy's always secondary in the advertising, and so. The women will look at that and go, I want that dress. I want to be as beautiful as that woman there. And the guy looks at the girl and goes, I want that girl. So I got to dress like that guy in the background with the suit and tux or, you know, whatever the hell he's wearing to get mm -hmm. that girl. And that's how we think. Women women aren't like, I, I want to get that guy, so I got to get that, you know, get that dress. They're just like, I want to get that dress so I look beautiful. Um, and so it's interesting, that drive that goes in behind it. Um, I don't, I, you know, if, if, yeah, I, I, there's a certain point where you just go, Hey man, just choose what you want to do. So like I choose to, I, I go to the gym, I work out, I eat a really healthy diet. Uh, I, I you know, I, I eat beets, broccoli, uh, what else is on my daily regimen? I go sit in the, out in the sun 20 minutes a day for vitamin D. Uh, I, uh, there's Brussels sprout. There's a whole diet thing that I have now that's very salad and farm friendly. In fact, I get raw milk from the milk store, um, and, and local farms. I get all my salad and my fruits and vegetables. And, um, but I focus on what I want. I, what I'm trying to say is I don't, I'm not busy with the Vogue stuff and the crap mm -hmm. that gets fed to me. Hey, do you want better skin? Drink Coke and snort it. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. You know, I, I just, I, yeah, bullshit with all that. You know, fuck you with your little advertisements there. And I see what I see what angle you're playing at me. And so I just kind of focus on what I want to do and things that make me better. And I'm not only competing with anybody on it. I'm actually competing with myself, really, when it comes down to it. Like, when I go to the gym, I'm not trying to look like, you know, the liver king. Because I'd have to take roids for that. Yeah. What I'm competing with is against myself. And I'm like, can I do an extra five pounds today? You know that sort of thing and move up in those increments yeah well those is that are healthier those, absolutely like those are life enhancing experiences 
I mean, they're, they're, mm. they're things that, you know, you uh, you get a sense of mastery from. Like, yeah, you know, I'm getting fitter. So that's, that's you know, that's really good. I'm, every time I go, I'm getting a little bit stronger. I'm feeling healthier because it's flushing endorphins through my body. I'm feeling more alive. I'm feeling more vital. I can concentrate better. Um, you know, I'm looking after myself in terms of my diet. So, you know, my digestive system is working a bit better. And I'm feeling like, you know, that's having an impact on all sorts of things. Uh, we know gut health is so important to mental health and physical health so you know all of these things you know they have like a compounding impact right like mm -hmm. each one on their own might seem you know just a kind of another lifestyle thing but if you add them all together you get a, you know you get such a, a an immense sense of purpose and and i suppose health now that's very different to you know what most of those things that we're talking about by the way are, are free <laughs> like, you could do them for no cost obviously you're going to pay for the gym membership and you know you go yeah. buy your groceries or whatever but you know on the whole you go out in the sun that doesn't cost you anything you know you go for a run doesn't cost you anything you know what's really curious is a lot of these things don't really cost a great deal and they bring so mm. much to our lives and yet you know that thirty thousand dollar handbag or whatever it costs the world and yet, what does it what does it do beyond that kind of five minute hit of happiness, right? It just and then it evaporates and then it's gone as if mm. it didn't exist in the first place. So, like uh, you know, you're absolutely right. It's really about finding things in your life that fulfill you, things that make you healthier and happier, and and trying to, as much as you can to avoid the lure of being lured back into those kind of quick hits, those kind mm -hmm. of dopamine hits. That's like, oh, I've got to buy this. Oh, I feel better, and now, oh, now I feel shitty again. So, like. That's that's the biggest. That's hard, as I say. I keep saying this, but it's an important point because in this culture, you're bombarded with those pressures. But if you can just, you know, if you can just sit back and focus on other things that are much more life enhancing, then you are going to feel a lot better. There you go. It, it makes all the difference in the world. And you know, I, it, it's interesting. I'll talk to people and they'll buy stuff, and I'll be like, "That doesn't really make you more attractive, especially with men. Like, we don't care. We don't. You know, I'll." I'll I'll see these women, they pay for these uh, Louis Vuitton or, you know, Christian, whatever. I, I don't even, I clearly have no fashion sense or care. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you'll, you'll hear that they spend like thousands on a shoe and you're just like, we as men, we really don't care. Like, we just don't care. No, like, there's no woman I've ever met and been like, you know, you're really hot and you're really a cool person and, and have a great personality and everything's put together on you. But I, that's sh those shoes. That's yeah, that's not gonna work. You know, that dress, no, it's not gonna work. Never happens, never happens. But uh, so you know, I, I think we need to have more gratitude, we need to have more basic stuff. I think maybe we need to take control of what we want as opposed to you know the bullshit that's sold to us for advertising. Because Jesus, if you went out and bought every bullshit item that's been offered that will make your life better, you know, <laughs> you're still gonna be unhappy yeah i mean we could you that's the whole point is economy right it can never be enough because if it was enough right think about it right if it was enough and we stopped consuming and everybody felt a sense of purpose and happiness then people are going to lose their jobs very very in very short order right the advertiser is going to lose the job the person who delivers the goods to the shop is going to lose their job the person that sells is going to lose their job so you're going to see this quick cas downward cascade of the whole economy if we don't have these feelings so this is why you know i'll go back to this point about it being quite profound but you know it, it's it is the case that we have to trade our present happiness for something more in order to keep the whole show on the road and and we have to keep doing that and and people that are able to step away from that I have some admiration because it's so tough because there's so much bombardment and pressure going on. Um, but you know, this is just the way the economy works and this is how it is. And, you know, I think yeah. if we can appreciate that, understand that and try as hard as we can to find purpose within that society, that's the route to happiness. But as I said, I just want to be clear, right? Like it doesn't mean that you have to kind of completely rid yourself of all these trappings of modern life. Like sometimes it's fine. If you want to get a Rolex, no problem. Like if that makes you feel good, like do, but do it for the right reasons, you know, like exactly. do it it's yeah. a sense of accomplishment, you know, it's like, okay, I worked really hard. I got this paycheck. I'm going to treat myself. Right. And that's the, it's a fulfillment. Like it's, it's, it's reward for the hard work, not just because you wanted to like show it off or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, I, I'm not completely anti-capitalist at all. Uh, I think, you know, it, it's absolutely the right thing for people to want nice things in their lives. But I'm just saying, you know, we have to understand that there's also a bigger picture. And mm -hmm. the bigger picture is that the way we feel is because we kind of have to feel it. Yeah. And and we have huge amounts of depression. In fact, they've shown that, uh, especially young women, 
uh, that are in their uh, teens and stuff, looking at Instagram and seeing this perfect world, you know, this fake presentation, the, the pressure on the, that they put on themselves is even more extraordinary. And it's very hard. So basically, basically what you're saying is uh, we need to be like Saturday Night Live's uh, Stuart Smalley, which is Al Franken back in the day who became center, uh, where we just say, uh, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. <laughs> <laughs> we we need to, yeah. Like um, the advertiser is not going to be very pleased, uh, and sooner or later the president's going to have a few problems with that too. Uh oh, but <laughs> but, goes but, to the toilet, the, but he goes, but 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 you know, if we want to be happy, absolutely, that kind of acceptance. And I think actually, you know what? Like, here's the thing: economies are already slowing down anyway. Right, aging mm -hmm. populations, overhang of debt, the global era of globalization is coming to an end where goods were just imported on the cheap. Right, that's getting mm -hmm. more expensive to do that now. So we're this is why we're seeing inflation. By the way, this is one of the reasons, not just because of these geopolitical issues. And and so I think what we have to do is kind of see this as a bit of an opportunity, right? Like we're getting this secular stagnation, and it's really freaking people out. It's like, oh my god, like how do we get more growth? This is you know, but actually, why 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 can't we learn to kind of try and exist and live within a economy mm. where we have abundance and and you know um we we kind of live in a kind of sustainable almost circular economy where sometimes gdp will go up that's great sometimes it won't sometimes it'll stay flat that's also fine we can you know we can tolerate that we don't always have to grow all the time um you know we live in an era of abundance mm. uh, we've kind of solved the scarcity problem through economic growth so it's been worth it <laughs> mm. but now we have to understand how we're going to land the plane and I think sometimes, yeah. like you know, it's okay for us to take these challenges these, uh, of like we don't always have to organize our economy in this way. Sometimes we can like take a step back. We can figure it's good enough, and actually maybe that should be the target for policymakers moving forward. I don't know. There you go. Have you ever? Uh, last question. Have you ever studied minimalist, the minimalist movement? I think there's some guys who did a book that are really popular, run a podcast about the minimalists. You ever studied those folks? And what are your thoughts on it? I've I've heard of the movement. Uh, I can't say I've done too much research into them, but I mm -hmm. I get the principles. You know, going back to yeah. basics, enough yeah. is plenty, and all that sort of yeah. thing. Like you know, I can get on board with it. Uh, again, I'm not sure if I myself would be able to go the extreme, <laughs> live inside a box kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, like you know, I would say there's some value value to that. Yeah. And I'm sure I'd be interested to know like what it's like psychologically and how those you know how, do, do those people feel free? Do they feel liberated? I, I think it'd be it'd be an interesting experiment they kind of they focus on uh, kind of what you talk about they they kind of talk they focus on buying what they what they want not overextending themselves paying cash uh you know it, it, you, you need to you need, buy a couch okay there you go you got a couch you don't need to be buying another one next week and one next year and 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 you 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 know do you really need the range rover you know the land rover or whatever do you really need the mercedes benz um, I mean, if you want to buy one, like you say, you know, if you want to buy a Rolex or you want to buy a Mercedes, yeah, hey, buy one. But, you know, I, I lived my life, too, when I became successful where I was buying everything. And it was the old line from Fight Club again, where it was like, we buy things to impress people that don't give a shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was buying BMWs love, love that, and houses and, and all this stuff and throwing parties at my house to impress people. And people would just be like, eh, whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I would even date people that would be like, why do you have to have a big house in, a, you know, in the canyon and, the, and, you know, the BMWs? And I'd be like, well, I grew up poor. And I'm, yeah. doing this to, I'm doing this to kind of heal what I thought was a wound. But I also, you know, I thought it was impressive people. And then after a while, I'm like, no one really gives a fuck. And they don't <laughs> care. You know? So true. So and true. so why am I breaking my you know craziness and we see these we see these uh people here you know the the prices of cars went through the roof here in america i'm sure that maybe they did over on your end of the pond they did yeah um and we see these young people that half their income is going towards a car it's one of the reasons they can't buy a house it's because they're, they've got like 1500 to 2000 a month car payments yeah and it's and you're like Man, just buy like a used old car, man. You don't need to have the 2023 fucking <laughs> whatever, man. Like, like you know, you just need something to get you from A to Z, you know. In my day and age, you bought a car to impress chicks. 
Yeah. But, you know, but you bought a muscle car or something. You didn't buy, like, I don't know, a, a Kia. <laughs> 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 all five people in our key audience uh, it's a very metro car they're like damn uh, very, i'm never getting laid very anyway. <laughs> no no i i certainly i mean look i do you know what when you what you said there like completely resonates with me like you, i grew up poor too and i spent my whole life really trying to compensate or overcompensate for that uh young mm-hmm. adulthood one of the reasons that the, you know i suffered with perfectionism was because i was trying to lift myself above all these middle class kids he, I just felt was so much bad, so much articulate, I had so much going for them. And I, you know, I drove myself crazy um, because, you know, this insecurity, like this inferiority that I felt deep inside of me that I just needed to uh, soothe. Um, yeah. And I get it. Like, I totally get it. And, but, you know, I've kind of feel like I've had the epiphany that you've had. It's just, you know, it's, yeah. it doesn't get you, it doesn't make you any happier. And at the end of the day, like you don't really get anywhere anyway. Um, it's, 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 it's a hopeless quest. So just try and be happy. That's amazing. Yeah. And you, you mentioned about, you know, trying to keep up with your friends who appear to be successful. I think one of the problems we have in, in, in our culture is we see people on the outside on what they're presenting and we don't see the internal fucking horror show that's probably going on there. Like we had a gentleman, uh, Mauricio, I forget his last name, but he's married to one of those Beverly Hills housewives, of Beverly Hills chicks. And, and women love that show. And it just looks like all the women are just rolling in money and stuff. And lately we've been finding out they're all bankrupt and going to jail for not paying the, their taxes and stuff. Um, they're not really all that. And, you know, he, he was married for, I think it's 27 years or something. And, you know, he came on the show. He's really gracious. And, uh, you know, it talked about his marriage and, and, you know, I love and, you know, so great. He's getting divorced now. Right. And I think she's running off with, I think another woman or something or whatever the rumors are. And, and so you don't see, like you see these people and present it. You don't know what sort of horror show might be going on in their personal life. Yeah, and that's only exacerbated with social media, right? Because social yeah. media is given the perfect platform for us to curate our perfect lives and lifestyles in the way that we want others to see. But what goes on underneath is uh, obviously not not that reality. And that, by the way, that's really psychologically problematic because it creates a very deep disconnect between mm-hmm. who we want, the perfect person in our minds that we want other people to see and the imperfect person we really are, right? And that creates a lot of conflict, a lot of anxiety, a lot of tension, because all the time we're faking it. Fake it till mm-hmm. you make it, right? We started the show. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, all the time you're going through life, faking the perfect life, knowing deep down that you are not this perfect person that you're predicting and trying to disguise this imperfect person everywhere you go. Psychologically, that's really probably one of the reasons we're seeing many of these issues of anxiety, depression is because of this alienation, this self-alienation, mm-hmm. the sense that we're not with ourselves we're trying to be somebody else, somebody perfect. And I think social media has a lot to say about this, but it's it's definitely a societal problem. There you go. Well, everyone should order your book up and read about it. Give us your .com so people can find you on the interweb, sir. Uh, it's Tom uh, Curran, so T-H-O-M-C-U-R-R-A-N.com. There you go. Thank you very much, Tom, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Chris. There you go. And folks, not everyone can be perfect like me. I mean, there's only been two of us in the history of the world, and we know what they did with the first guy was perfect. And uh, I don't know, they're still working on building something out for me, evidently, uh, for what I hear. Uh, The Perfection Trap. You can order wherever fine books are sold. Embracing the power of good enough. Or in my case, eh, whatever. Uh, So there you go. It's available August 8th, 2023, wherever fine books are sold. Order it up. Uh, Learn to have a healthier mindset to this stuff, people. Uh, Have some balance and gratitude in life. Eh, Enjoy the ride. One of the, you know, one of the things we didn't talk about, I'll throw this in here in the show, last end of the show, fuck it. Um, One of the problems I had in in, in my youth, in my early uh, early life, adult life, was, um, fuck, I just lost it was uh basically enjoying the journey because i was always after the goal and people would be like chris it's not about the goal it's about enjoying the journey take some time to look around take some time to enjoy yourself that's what i'm telling you thanks for tuning in be good to each other stay safe and we'll see you guys 